welcome to the Jet Setter Show, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. Enjoy and learn from a variety of experts on topics ranging from upscale travel at wholesale prices to retiring overseas, to global real estate and business opportunities, to tax havens and expatriate opportunities. You'll get great ideas on unique cultures, causes, and cruise vacations. Whether you're wealthy or just want to live a wealthy lifestyle, The Jet Setter Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Jet Setter Show. This is Jason Hartman, your host, where we explore lifestyle-friendly destinations worldwide. I think you'll enjoy the interview we have for you today, and we will be back with that in less than 60 seconds here on the Jet Setter Show. It's my pleasure to welcome Matthew Montague Pollock back to the show. He is the founder of Global Property Guide and the fantastic resources for property purchase, sale, and rent values throughout the globe. And he's a very knowledgeable gentleman coming to us today from just outside London, England in a uh, city called Bristol. Matthew, welcome. How are you? I'm very well, Jason. Thank you for that kind introduction. Well, the pleasure is all mine, and it's great to have you back on the show again. You are just a a walking encyclopedia, or at least your website is. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, hey, let's start with just sort of your general take on world real estate, world economies, and let's circle the globe, if you will, and talk about some different markets. Well, I mean, it's been very encouraging to see what's happening in the U.S. with the great revive, the great revival of property values there, which seems to be having a big impact on the wider economy. Well, you know, when you print a lot of fake money, it creates a seeming blessings <laughs> that turn into curses later, <laughs> called yeah, but inflation. That's true, but that's, but this- well, this, this, this new kind of monetarism has suddenly become fashionable, it's true. But unfortunately, in Europe, when we're uh, still stuck very much, uh, and so the situation is very different. Now, I think one of the things which, of course, is going to happen is that people from the U.S. and also, to a less extent, for Canada, are going to recover their appetite for buying abroad or overseas as they feel a bit richer. And we're already seeing that we see an increase in traffic on our site, partly, I think, because U.S. people are coming on it, on it and, uh, and looking at properties uh, abroad. And, uh, uh, I mean, one of the things in Europe is there are opportunities in some of these countries because things have got so bad. We see interest starting in both Ireland and in Spain. Uh, in Spain, the Russians are there because the prices have fallen so far in the south of Spain, they're uh, now often a third of what they used to be, that the values are quite compelling, despite the fact that the streets are crowded with people without any work and 56% of people under 24 are unemployed. And and overall unemployment, I hear, is around 27%. Yeah. And I'm sure in Spain and every other country, the government manipulates those numbers to make them look better than they really are. <laughs> so that's another thing to be careful of. But, but yeah, the south of Spain is, is really quite interesting. I mean, what a gorgeous place. However, the question is, are we at a bottom or are, are, is there going to be a complete collapse and will things get a lot worse? I mean, with so much unemployment and desperation, that's not a good sign. No, it's, it's difficult to know. I just think that it will be, it's going to be a very different economy in future. And to some extent, the foreigners will support it if you're buying in attractive places rather than mass housing estates which have been hugely overbuilt. If you go in and buy a pleasant villa with a swimming pool which is near some 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 seaside and near some cultural town, well, I think if you're buying a third of what it was six years ago, it's, it, I can't say you're, you can't go wrong, but it's it, it's an opportunity. And the Russians are not wrong to be jumping in on that. And and in a way, a, a slightly different thing is happening in Ireland, which is probably perhaps not of such great interest to people from the U.S., but Dublin is beginning to revive because, again, the crash was so enormous. And you see rental yields up quite high at sort of 6 7 8% in the center of Dublin. And people are beginning to say, well, why, why shouldn't I 
you know, it's it's worth buying. It's worth buying perhaps to rent out to people. And you begin to see the, the values bottoming. Two, two questions for you before you just move on there. First of all, since a, a lot of our audience is, is U.S.-based, certainly not all of it. We have listeners all over the world. But explain rental yields, if you would, because U.S. people don't use that metric, at least not in the same way. Of course, whether you're using cap rate or cash on cash return, it all comes down to the same thing. But rental yields is a kind of a... Nobody much uses it except the global property guy. Right. But, uh, it's basically the same idea as price to rent ratio. Your rent, rental yield essentially means the return you get if you invest, if you've got a house which is worth 100000 and you're getting 3000 3, would that be right? 3000 in rent per year out of it, that's a rental yield of, of 3%. Right, right. And and I just want everybody to notice that you didn't have yeah. to mention the currency there because it's currency agnostic. So if it's 100,000 euros to buy the property and 3,000 euros annually in, in net income, then it's 3%. If it's dollars, right. it's dollars. If it's yen, it's yen. It doesn't matter what the currency is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So so rental yields of 6 to 7% in Dublin uh, yeah, often uh, often higher on on smaller properties, so that becomes quite attractive, especially when you know that the properties are really perhaps forty five percent of what they were five years ago. And often, you know, Dublin is not an unattractive place. So, and uh, it's true that you still have a big overhang of properties across the country which uh, and uh, people who've taken out mortgages and who won't be able to repay their mortgages, but you could have said that about the U.S. only only 18 months ago, and we're seeing quite a big uh, rebound now. And I I strongly believe that that kind of process is going to happen in Ireland, and that you're going to have see something like the U.S. experience uh, repeating itself. Sure, sure. Now, before you move on even past Ireland, back to Spain for a moment, if you would, because that's just such an attractive place in terms of natural beauty. Any particular cities or towns that you want to mention? I know that you, you, you're basically looking at the entire planet, so you may not drill down to that level, I would completely understand, but just offhand, if you have any... Yeah, we're well, not very good on, on particular cities. It depends. It, it really depends what you like. Of course, the Brits, and I'm a representative of the Brit, Brit, Brits, uh, are very fond of the, the South Spain, but they're also fond of the South of Portugal. There's a, there's a, a strong historical association with the, between the UK and the South of Portugal, uh, the Algarve. But as as to places, I, I don't know. <laughs> okay. All right. Fair enough. No, just thought I'd ask. Okay. I, I can't help you. We're, we're talking in terms of buying, but of course, the other thing which I always think is attractive is what I did. And when we were talking the other evening, it sounded as if you were going to do the, thing, the, the thinking of the same thing, which is taking you, assuming you've got a property in the US, saying, to heck with this, let me go and live with somewhere else for a, a year or two and rent out your property in the US and arbitrage it and, and use the money and go and get uh, and go and rent a property in another country. I did this uh, in Manila, Philippines, when I took a very small apartment that I had in a not very attractive part of London, and I got myself in the center of the capital, in the second most affluent subdivision, gated community, a very large house with swimming pool, with space for two maids and a driver. And if you'd seen my previous apartment, you would have thought, you know, this guy is almost a welfare case. And then I transfer to Manila and I have this luxurious life. And this sort of exchange is very, very, I, it, I think it's very attractive and very possible uh, in many places. I mean, especially if you're coming from somewhere like New York, where the, 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 the prices, you know, the rents and the prices are so high. Oh, oh, listen, you are absolutely right, Matthew. I mean, and it, you can even do this within the United States as, as well course. as within your home country, wherever you happen to be listening. You know, I moved from Newport Beach to uh, Phoenix, Arizona, and sands the, the hot, dry summers. Everything is better here. I mean, I am a renter in a beautiful penthouse, and I get much more than I did in California for much less money and really enjoy the life a lot more out here, frankly. 
So renting is is a great opportunity, and especially if you're a person of means who's renting what in that market is considered a high-end property. There's I always talk on uh, my Creating Wealth show about rent elasticity or the lack thereof. Rents only typically rise to sort of a certain amount, and then the ratio gets very out of whack on a high-end property. So that's a very good observation because what you uh, the ideal, and I'm uh, and I'm sure we're one, one mind here. The ideal is to take a not very good property in a high-end city for which you can get a huge rent and arbitrage it for a very good property in a less expensive city uh, or a less expensive country where you can enjoy a much better lifestyle. And I think this is sort of the ideal. Sure, sure. Well, well, that begs the question, and I think most expats would be very wise to rent before buying because there are so many dimensions to becoming an expat and, and living offshore. What markets really make sense to be a renter, maybe? Uh, do you look at that? Yeah, well, I was I was thinking about this and uh, sort of assuming again that I that we're dealing with someone who comes from New York, <laughs> and, and, and we have, spending a lot of money. In other words, we have spending a lot of money or or getting a lot of money if you take your apartment and rent it out. Uh, and we have on our site a comparison between rents around the world for apartments of uh, 120 square meters, which in square feet is about. About 1,200. Uh, 1, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. uh, 12 or 1,300. Yeah, just multiply times 10 generally. It's close enough for government work, <laughs> as the <laughs> saying goes. <laughs> and for your 1,200 square feet apartment, I mean, I've just been doing the round of various places. If you wanted to go to Lisbon, Portugal, you could get nearly 6,000 square feet rather than 12,000 square feet. Now, that is a very substantial apartment. I mean, or, or but just by renting out one, and getting the other. If you went to Cyprus, you could get 7,700 square feet. It's, you, know, you can get six times the space for the same, for the same money. Uh, so you probably wouldn't rent an apartment, you'd probably rent a house at a swimming pool. And in terms of upgrading your, your quality of life, of course, the other element is what kind of country you go to. You were talking about Santiago, Chile, and I would imagine, I mean, I haven't, you, do you know Chile? Uh, a little bit, sure, yeah. I mean, I, I think Chile is one of the one of the, one of of the the countries I really want to talk about. I'm, I'm hearing such good things about Chile lately that they've really gotten their act together and, and just a lot of good stuff. So please, tell yeah. us more. I, when I was, well, it, by my calculation, you can get five, five and a half times in Santiago, the capital. Uh, oh, sorry, I've got it wrong. Uh, three and a half times. Uh, this, uh, in Santiago, the capital of Chile, than what you could get in New York. So it's 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 quite an upgrade. It's not an enormous upgrade, but it's quite an upgrade. For your 1,200 square feet, you get four four and a half four and a half hundred uh, four thousand five hundred. So I mean, and the other thing I I don't know about Chile because I don't know the country well enough. If you, if you're moving to some countries, you also get much cheap, cheaper personal services. So you could probably afford to have a mate or two mates. You know. If you are going to the third world, and this is this makes life easier. I don't know if that's the case in Chile, because it's quite a developed uh, economy, and it may be that 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 era, that time has passed already. But it certainly would be the case in Uruguay, in Ecuador, probably in Costa Rica, probably in Panama, certainly in Peru, that you you, you not only find your rent is. I mean, Lima is, you get six times as much space in, in Lima <laughs> as you do in, in New York for the same money, no surprise. But you also get probably a couple of maids and a driver, if you happen to want a driver. So your, the whole, your whole style of life takes a, a, a huge upgrade, which is attractive to some people, attractive to me, certainly. Fantastic. Well, no question about it. And the other part of that upgrade that many people don't notice that I noticed in moving from California to Arizona is that in California, maybe you've heard the saying, even if you win the rat race, you're still a rat. <laughs> That's kind of a funny saying. <laughs> but but I think it holds a lot of truth to it, Matthew, because, you know, living in California, I was very successful. And I felt like I had, in a sense, won the rat race. You know, I mean, I Certainly, there were people much more successful than I, but I, you know, I felt like I was doing well. I was ahead of things. But what what you don't realize a lot of times is that everybody living around you pretty much is struggling to live in such an expensive sp uh, place. So the resources are very scarce. 
and, and, and those people are very stressed, and so they become less friendly and more insular to some degree, and things are just tougher. It maligns motivations. And, and then when you look at how much it costs to run a business in a given place, fewer new restaurants open or entertainment venues, there's less less shopping opportunities and, and less convenience, less parking at, at the shopping center, and the restaurants are more crowded because there are fewer businesses when it becomes restrictive and expensive to run a business. So as a customer, yeah. your customer experience declines. So so there are a lot of interesting interconnected issues with this. But uh, So it's not just about space and the area in which you live, although those are very important factors. But talk to us about some other uh, maybe highlights as, as we go around the globe. Right. Well, I, yes. I, uh, I, I mean, I'm a I'm a sort of third world junkie, which I think is a little bit different to you because I like, I very much appreciate the sensation of stepping back in time in a, in a sense. To, well, go to Cuba. That's the perfect place for it. And probably Myanmar now. <laughs> that's probably, actually, I was, yeah, Myanmar, of course, is, is, it's open. Is, yeah. is open and extremely attractive. Uh, there's a sort of, amongst people I know here, there's just a, a sort of, pilgrimage for all my friends to Myanmar because they enjoy it so much and they find it so beautiful. Uh, but a lot of that is is sort of European nostalgia for the, the uh, cities as they were in colonial times or before modernity hit them. And of course, poor old Myanmar hasn't got much modernity because it's been preserved in stone by its terrible military regime for 45 years or however long it is. But but that uh, for for the for the for the vulgar tourist, I'm afraid that has has its upsides. And and you are seeing, I mean, uh, you are seeing people coming in and enjoying that. So I mean, I th- I think it would be interesting. I think Cambodia. Would you believe it? The the scene of the massacres, Phnom Penh, is a charming city. The the Cambodians are very very a- attractive and pleasant people. The city is has been rebuilt in a new old in an it's spotless, but it's not a modern city. It's not crowded. And again, you you get a six-fold increase from, for your New York apartment. You get a six-fold increase in living space and in all the rest of the amenities. If you happen to want to go and bury yourself in Phnom Penh, uh, I mean, you could then, in Asia, you could choose modernity and uh, brave the pollution of Shanghai and, and all its many attractions and terrors. Well, well, you could in China, for example, but if you want a modern, clean country, I mean, clean is their middle name almost, how is Singapore doing? It's probably very expensive. I uh, it's quite expensive, but of course, still, you're doing a lot better than New York, That's for good reason. So you're still getting a, a, quite an uptick. It's, Singapore is never on Hong Kong level. I haven't got the figures in front of me, but I would imagine you get about... Uh, 60 or 70 percent uptick in space for your money, perhaps a bit more. That's pretty significant compared to Hong Kong. Uh, yeah, well, Hong Kong's just gone crazy this, these last two years. But, uh, but of course, Sing- and Singapore has many, many charms. It's culturally rich now. It's becoming more liberal. The air is clean. It's you can you can you you can get a bit of a domestic service, you know, and you can you can jet out of there to the rest of Asia very easily. Uh, and all the uh, tax rates are low. All those things are attractive. Uh, it's a little bit intense for my taste, but uh, <laughs> it's not. Uh, I never find that culture very relaxed. I'm uh, in Asia. I'm more a Southeast Asia p- p- place person. I prefer the Philippines, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia as cultures because the people are so incredibly relaxed. I mean, an example from the Philippines. They, um, there was a, a time when the, the Filipinos were sending troops in to help the U.S. and the rest of us in Iraq. And the terrorists, or the opposition, however you want to call them, kidnapped one Filipino soldier and said, we'll kill him unless the Filipino army withdraws and takes its troops back to, the, to Manila. What happened? The Filipino army withdrew. (laughs) And the strange thing was that this was the most popular thing in the country. It was a hugely, in in a corrupt presidency, this was extraordinarily popular. And for me, this is very reasonable. These people seem to me extraordinarily reasonable people. Then what were they doing fighting in Iraq? It's got nothing to do with them. And they didn't want their people killed. And they 
uh, and they made it clear. And I find that the Southeast Asians are very reasonable in that way. This has got nothing to do, of course, with property. Let's talk about property. <laughs> Where else should we go in the, in, in the globe? Of course, there well, is... Well, you know, I'd like to explore maybe a little bit of Central and South America and definitely get into more of Europe. For example, you've got an article on your site about Ukraine, Hungary, some of the Eastern countries are, are somewhat interesting. You could almost argue that some of them are second world, maybe not third. But I, And I wonder what's going on in Belarus. I mean, that, that's like almost as mysterious as North Korea. Well, not that bad, but... <laughs> yeah. Well, I think both Ukraine and Belarus are very tough and difficult places. And uh, I've tended not to find out too much about them because what's the point? Yeah, well, yeah, but Ukraine isn't like Belarus in terms of its government. It's right. quite no, that's... A, sig- a significant difference there. Yeah. Yeah. Then there are the the Hungarys, etc. Hungary, of course, going through a, a bit of a bad patch with a sort of nearly fascist government. Czechoslov- the Czech Republic, always very attractive. Slovakia, very attractive. And I think you're going to see, my hunch is that with the whole of Eastern Europe, you're going to see a recovery there before the rest of Europe, because well, especially in the ones which are not pegged to the euro, because they've been able to depreciate their, their currencies and they're becoming, and the, the scale of the crisis has been quite significant. But I think that the that the history of communism means that they are more open to the whole. In a way, they're more free free market because they were once communist. You see this very strongly in the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia, and uh, Estonia and Latvia particularly. That having been communist, Estonia is now this absolute exemplar of. Uh, liberal adjustment that has downgraded its wages, it's spending less money, uh, and it's becoming much more competitive. And I think you will see that throughout Eastern Europe. And I wouldn't be surprised if the recovery in Europe is led by Eastern Europe. Very, very interesting. Are there any Eastern countries you want to mention? I mean, I I remember being in uh, Bulgaria a couple of years ago, shortly, well, a few years ago after it joined the EU, and seeing all the new road projects and and going out to, I just knew that market was a total bubble. It it was unbelievable. And and of course, it did crash, as I predicted. Uh, I went to Bansko, probably the poster child for their bubble. And wow, that, that really had a correction pretty significant. But anything in these countries, in these Eastern countries you want to touch on specifically? I don't know how Romania is doing. And then I I don't want to forget to talk about Italy, another country on the verge of an economic mess, but physically and brand-wise as a tourist, such an attractive place. Very, very attractive. Unfortunately for the property market, it hasn't had its crisis enough yet. And it hasn't sunk very, very much. So I don't think you're getting wonderful deals in Italy, and I'm not sure that you ever will, because uh, who would refuse uh, a house by the lake in Italy? This is this is uh, such an obvious value that you can hit the economy as much as you want, and those properties are always going to be attractive to international buyers. So I don't think I, I, Palermo may collapse, but I don't see that uh, Umbria or uh, is is going to is going to collapse. I'm, I've always been attracted to Hungary because we've always noticed that yields are rather high in Hungary. And at the moment, the uh, recession is hitting it rather hard. And we've noticed particularly that all the, the old communist bloc type apartments have collapsed in, in value this year, particularly. But the newer ones are going up. So there is obviously some kind of transition uh, happening that that new money is coming in. And I think that, uh, I suspect that you will see, you, you buy there and you're getting eight, eight, nine percent yields uh, in Budapest. So I, I, I would be very surprised if we don't see a rebound in Hungary. Of course, it dep- does depend how unpleasant the government becomes with, with a sort of policy of persecuting gypsies and such like. And then, of course, there are places like Cyprus. I mean, Cyprus is going to be an interesting one. I suppose uh, th- there is a, a a place where you would get for your 1,200 square feet in New York, you get, by our calculations, nearly 8,000 square feet. So you get a tremendous up, uh, uplift in rent. And it's very attractive, uh, despite the crisis. But And then we have this puzzle of London and these huge values in London. We reckon that London is now the most expensive place to rent in central, real central London, the high-end London, the most expensive place 
to rent property bar none. It's more expensive than Monaco, even. Wow. More expensive, more expensive than Hong Kong. Now, can this continue? Does it make sense for... I mean, this is Russian money and Chinese money and, all, and Middle Eastern trophy money coming into London. But I don't know that it really makes sense for a capital city of a slightly failing country, which has no export industry, to be, to be valued so much. I would agree. I would agree that cities like London and New York are largely built on a uh, smoke and mirrors economy, a financial services economy, which isn't, isn't real. You mentioned the export issue. I, I agree. I think ultimately that that economy will continue to uh, have scandals and problems. And yeah, I mean, you look at the derivatives issues nowadays and wow, you just think, what a house of cards this is. <laughs> <laughs> There's a big difference between the Wall Street economy and the real economy. You were talking about that you'd be, attra- you'd be attracted to come in uh, to live in, in Europe. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Where would you choose? I don't know, you know, but I don't know. Vienna's a nice city. There are so many attractive places in Europe, even though it's on the verge of collapse. <laughs> Vienna is not <laughs> in on the, so many the ways. Been going up. For the last eight years, Vienna, Vienna has been going up. But it's still quite a, not so expensive to rent. Uh, you could also choose Copenhagen, which is very, very attractive. Of course, more boring, probably. Uh, less centrally placed. Well, tell us what, uh, what, what else is going on, and let's look at South America again. You know, I mean, we touched on Chile, we touched on a couple of other places. Argentina's always in the news. It's so corrupt, it's almost part of its charm. <laughs> right. But any other uh, South American areas? Well, in, in terms of prices, we sort of assume that the, the, the Brazil boom is, is coming to an end, although it never seems to end. We keep predicting it's going to end, but it, it steamrollers on. The, the thing that concerns me about Brazil is the violence and the crime, and a great place other than, other than that, <laughs> you know? Yeah, that's uh, sure. Which, uh, that's a pretty big detail. It's pretty important. It is pretty important. Well, if Uruguay is kind of very safe, and you get, um, in Montevideo, you get quite a, an uptick in your, in, uh, in your rental values. You get, you get about four and a half times what you would get in New York for, for the same money. So your arbitrage pays off there. Uh, and Panama, I don't know what you think about Panama. Well, you know, I think it's probably the best place in Central America, which yeah. isn't saying a whole lot for me. But again, I'm different than a lot of people. I, I may be the opposite of you. I mean, people love Belize. They love Costa Rica. Those places just don't do it for me, personally. Yeah. But it just depends what you want. If you want to spend your life sitting on the beach, hey, more power to you. It's just not my kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I'm quite fond of the beach. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. You live in London, so that's no surprise, really. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to get... but you wouldn't want to be on one of our beaches. <laughs> we, 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 but we always want what we don't have. That's kind of the point. <laughs> yeah. Now, I would probably, uh, you know... I, 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 have you ever been to Ecuador, to, uh, to Quito? I have not been to Ecuador, but I've interviewed, and I'm really interested in going there ASAP. I have had Gary Scott, the sort of Ecuador expert. He's a, he's a real guru. He's been on my show a couple of times, and I really enjoy uh, Gary's writings. It's supposed to be a very, very charming city to live in, and, and easy to get out of into the countryside and all that sort of stuff. And it, uh, the, it also has the attraction that it is, the, on our list, it is the, the cheapest place to rent per square foot of any capital city on our list, which is not saying everything in the world because there may be some African countries which are not on our list. But it's extremely low cost. So for your 1,300 New York square feet, you can get 11,000 square feet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's <laughs> in, amazing. In, 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 so that's something to be said for it. So if you're combining the fact that it's said to be very attractive, I haven't been there, so I don't know, with the fact that it's very low cost. Right, right. Speaking of which, and just a curiosity, there's probably not much to talk about, unfortunately, but Africa, I mean, such a vast continent, vast resources, culturally and politically, so many places are kind of a mess. But any highlights there? Uh, yeah, I don't, I'm afraid, cover it enough because... There isn't the interest. You know, we, we already cover so much of the world. And we, we began to cover Africa, but there just wasn't... You, a website is very dependent on traffic, and there just wasn't the traffic to reinforce it. And plus, it was incredibly difficult to do the research. I mean, for instance, in Nigeria, we could never in Lagos get the prices of secondhand buildings, which is what we... We, we concentrate on. 
uh, for, to do our pricing. And I put this to a Nigerian friend, and he said, oh, no, 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 no. People won't buy secondhand stuff. They're afraid of the spirits. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> you say, you know, old buildings have got spirits. And it was, it was just impossible to, to get pricing. I don't know if that's still the case, but we sort of gave up. I mean, if we couldn't get pricing, what could we do? And so we haven't done a lot in, in Africa, outside South Africa. So anything else you want to wrap up with? Just any sort of big takeaways? I mean, we're seeing the U.S. market going through a, a, literally a, a bit of a boom in so many places in the U.S. Our investors are trying to buy everything they can get their hands on right now. But of course, that U.S. boom is going to translate into, bo into mini boomlets in all those satellite places, sure. like the bits of the Caribbean, which are satellite to the US, the bits of Central America, which are effectively a sort of satellite, all those property values, which have all been slumping. You can already see that in the Caribbean, but I'm sure there's a, a, a long way to go. So I do think it is the, uh, it continues to be the time to buy, perhaps uh, in some places in the US no longer, but I, I still think there's a long way to go. And I think people can look abroad around them uh, in their satellite zones and by there. Yeah, fantastic. Well, great to have you back on the show. The website is globalpropertyguide.com. Are there any other resources that you want to mention to people or any things on the site specifically that uh, might be of Stay special interest? The site is that it's, it, it's really designed for people who are buying with, a, with, at least at the back of their mind, the idea of investing in properties abroad. So we're very, very strong. We're uniquely strong on the financial aspect. And we have gone out and done our own research on every year we do research on 100, 100 countries, 105 countries, on how much it costs to buy a certain size apartment or house, how much you can rent it for, how much the transaction cost is, you know, how much you're paying in, in, in the, the whole process of buying and selling again, are you paying 5% or are you losing 18% as you do in some places? And plus we have extensive uh, legal guides and, and practice guides. And uh, so it, it is, I think, the, the, the most informative site for the overseas residential property buyer. That's all we do. We don't do commercial, so we're not at all like these big international uh, real estate companies. We we concentrate on the 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 buyer of houses and apartments who is a little bit interested in the financial side of things. Fantastic. Well, keep up the good work, and let's have you back on the show uh, with new updates on a regular basis. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Jason. It's been very nice talking to you. And call me up, and we can talk while we're not being listened to by your very large audience. <laughs> Fantastic. I'll certainly do that, Matthew. Thanks for joining us today. Okay. Bye bye. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc., exclusively.